Like a newborn child, the magician wept for a long time before he could speak. The poor old woman, he whispered at last. The unicorn said nothing, and Schmendrick raised his head and stared at her in a strange way. A gray morning rain was beginning to fall, and she shone through it like a dolphin. No, she said, answering his eyes, I can never regret. He was silent, crouched by the road in the rain, drawing his soaked cloak close around his body until he looked like a broken black umbrella. The unicorn waited, feeling the days of her life falling around her with the rain. I can sorrow, she offered gently, but it's not the same thing. When Schmendrick looked at her again, he had managed to pull his face together, but it was still struggling to escape from him. Where will you go now? he asked. Where will you where were you going when she took you? I was looking for my people, the unicorn said. Have you seen them, magician? They are wild and sea white like me. Schmendrick shook his head gravely. I have never seen anyone like you, not while I was awake. There were supposed to be a few unicorns left when I was a little boy, but I knew only one man who had ever seen one. They are surely gone, lady, all but you. When you walk, you make an echo where they used to be. No, she said, for there are others have seen them. It gladdened her to hear that there had still been unicorns as recently as the magician's childhood. She said, A butterfly told me of the red bull, and the witch spoke of King Haggard. So I am going, wherever they are, to learn whatever they know. Can you tell me where Haggard is king? The magician's face almost got away, but he caught it and began to smile very slowly, as though his mouth had turned to iron. He bent it into the proper shape and time, but it was an iron smile. I can tell you a poem, he said. Where all the hills are as lean as knives, and nothing grows, not leaves nor lives. Where hearts are sour as boiled beer, Haggard is the ruler here. I will know when I get there, then, she said, thinking that he was mocking her. Do you know any poems about the Red Bull? There are none, Schmendrick answered. He rose to his feet, pale and smiling. About King Haggard, I know only what I have heard, he said. He is an old man, stingy as late November, who rules over a barren country by the sea. Some say that the land was green and soft once, before Haggard came, but he touched it and it withered. There is a saying among farmers, when they look on a field lost to fire or locusts or the wind, as blighted as Haggard's heart. They say also that there are no lights in his castle, and no fires, and that he sends his men out to steal chickens and bedsheets and pies from window sills. The story has it that the last time King Haggard laughed, the unicorn stamped her foot. Schmendrick said, As for the Red Bull, I know less than I have heard for I have heard too many tales, and each argues with another. The bull is real, the bull is a ghost, the bull is Haggard himself when the sun goes down. The bull was in the land before Haggard, or it came with him, or it came to him. It protects him from raids and revolutions, and saves him the expense of arming his men. It keeps him a prisoner in his own castle. It is the devil, to whom Haggard has sold his soul. It is the thing he sold his soul to possess. The bull belongs to Haggard, Haggard belongs to the bull. The unicorn felt a shiver of sureness spread through her, widening from the center like a ripple. In her mind, the butterfly piped again. They passed down all the roads long ago, and the red bull ran close behind them and covered their footprints. She saw white forms billowing away in a bellowing wind, and yellow horns shaking. I will go there, she said. Magician, I owe you a boon, for you set me free. What would you have of me before I leave you? Schmendrick's long eyes were glinting like leaves in the sun. Take me with you. She moved away, cool and dancing, and she did not answer. The magician said, I might be useful. I know the way into Haggard's country, and the languages of the lands between here and there. The unicorn seemed very near to vanishing into the sticky mist, and Schmendrick hurried on. Besides, no wanderer was ever the worse for a wizard's company, even a unicorn. Remember the tale of the great wizard Nikos? Once in the woods he beheld a unicorn sleeping with his head in the lap of a giggling virgin, while three hunters advanced with drawn bows to slay him for his horn. Nikos had only a moment to act. With a word and a wave he changed the unicorn into a handsome young man, who woke 
and seeing the astonished bowman gaping there, charged upon them and killed them all. His sword was a twisted, tapered design, and he trampled the bodies when the men were dead. And the girl, the unicorn asked, did he kill the girl too? No, he married her. He said she was only an aimless child, angry at her family, and that all she really needed was a good man, which he was, then and always, for even Nikos could not give him back his first form. He died old and respected, on a surfeit of violets, some say. He could never get enough violets. There were no children. The story lodged itself somewhere in the unicorn's breath. The magician did him no service but great ill, she said softly. How terrible it would be if all my people had been turned into humans by well-meaning wizards, exiled, trapped in burning houses. I would sooner find that the red bull had killed them all. Where are you going now? Schmendrick answered. Few will mean you anything but evil, and a friendly heart, however foolish, may be as welcome as water one day. Take me with you, for laughs, for luck, for the unknown. Take me with you. The rain faded as he spoke. The sky began to clear, and the wet grass glowed like the inside of a seashell. The unicorn looked away, searching through a fog of kings for one king, and through a snowy glitter of castles and palaces for one built on the shoulders of a bull. No one has ever traveled with me before, she said, but then no one ever caged me before, or took me for a white mare, or disguised me as myself. Many things seem determined to happen to me for the first time, and your company will not surely be the strangest of them, nor the last. So you may come with me, if you like, though I wish you would ask me for some other reward. Schmendrick smiled sadly. I thought about it. He looked at his fingers, and the unicorn saw the half-moon marks where the bars had bitten him. But you could never have granted my true wish. There it is, the unicorn thought, feeling the first spidery touch of sorrow on the inside of her skin. That is how it will be to travel with a mortal all the time. No, she replied, I cannot turn you into something you are not, no more than the witch could. I cannot turn you into a true magician. I didn't think so, Schmendrick said. It's all right. Don't worry about it. I'm not worrying about it, the unicorn said. 